guys have your Bibles there and you've opened them up, let's all stand for the reading of the word. Jude 1 says, Jude, a bondservant of Jesus Christ and a brother of James, to those who are called and sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ, mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once and for all delivered unto the saints. You may be seated. As we look at what Jude is writing here, the word here to contend clearly means to, to fight. It means to stand. It also is a term that is used um, in athletic terminology to strenuously contend, to not give up, to not back down, to really exert yourself in an athletic way physically and to continue to do so without growing weary, continuing to move forward. From the text, we see here that his charge in these couple of verses is that they would fight and contend, that they would do battle. And it is, I would say, now more than ever, a time for war. But what does that war look like? What does it look like for you and I as Christians? Well, I don't think it was much different than in the time in which this epistle was written. It was written to Jewish Christians living in Jerusalem. And the idea behind this is he explains his initial intention in writing to them concerning our common salvation. Maybe think about this. Maybe he was going to be talking about just the joy and the blessedness that we have as, as being a body of believers and the fellowship that we have and who Christ is. But something moved and stirred his heart to write concerning the faith. Now, if you've studied the book of Jude, you know that there was a group that had apostatized. There were those who were actually kind of like in Paul's day, uh, preaching some pretty sideways stuff, and the church was being influenced by it. It's one of the things that we see today. Some time back, I was ministering here at Living Way, and I talked about this thing where I says, do you believe that the Lord is surprised by the way things are going, or is he concerned? Well, the answer is no, because the scriptures clearly teach that we are living out these days in which the Bible says they will grow darker. And we need to be the light that shines in all of this darkness. I says, what I believe, and this is just me speaking in terminology that we can understand. I says, I do believe there would be a concern. Jesus would have a concern with the way the church is going in these days. Because I'm no perfect person, nor am I the final authority. But I have deep concerns that the church may not be ready for the groom to come. Amen. We need to be a church that is solid on the truth of God's word. And I think sometimes we just kind of read these passages of Scripture and just kind of look over them and think, well, that was happening in Jude's day. You know, we got other things going on. No, listen, have you just ever done a study of what was taking place during the time that Paul and Peter and all these apostles were writing in the New Testament? Who was in charge? I mean, Nero was a pretty crazy guy. There was a lot of stuff taking place. There was stuff that wouldn't stand today that were taking place. And there's things that are similar that are taking place today, that was taking place then. But what do we see these apostles in the New Testament defending more than anything? The gospel of Jesus Christ, Amen. the good news. Why? Because it is the power of God. Amen. Maybe this might be a news flash for some of you, but God is still in the business of transforming lives. Amen. And he hasn't called some of us he has called all of us. So Jude says, I felt compelled to write to you to contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted to God's holy people. And I love this picture here, once for all. You know, for me personally, I look at this and the idea behind the word once in the original language, it's the Greek word kapax, which actually means a single time. Someone came and told me one time that that meant at once upon a time, but now something else can be written. And if you only knew who was debating with me the scriptures, well, it was a Mormon. And I says, now that book of Mormon doesn't work. That's not part of the gospels. 
and it's not in the New Testament. And he says, well, yes, it's to help you understand. I says, oh, no. I says, the faith has once and for all been delivered unto the saints. He says, oh, really? I says, yes. And I took him to that passage of scripture. And I says, it's also the same word that was used concerning Jesus Christ's sacrifice. He was sacrificed once for all. This is it. He wasn't sacrificed more than once. I says, the idea here is that we understand who we are in Christ. Now, Jude's idea here, I think, would be one of uh, importance for you and I. He's concerned because of the faith. Now, I was kind of thinking about this, you know. Uh, you guys ever watched the movie Nacho Libre? <laughs> Listen, it's one of my favorite movies, man. You know, it has to do with the church and orphanages and everything. So I say it's a biblical movie. <laughs> Anyways, but I love, I love this part in the movie where he looks at Skeleto. That's, that's my guy. Everybody knew a Skeleto in their lifetime, right? So I have like this fantasy, you know, that I'm Nacho Libre and then one of the brothers here in the church is Skeleto and we're just going to go and win this. But anyways, he tells Skeleto, I am concerned about your salvation and stuff. You know... <laughs> yeah, and stuff. We've seen how he baptized him, right? But, you know, when I look at that, I say, that should always be the concern of the church. It's a funny movie. But yet that point right there for me, I says, do I have that concern? And as funny as the movie might be, think about this for a moment, that word concern. Remember when Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians when he talked about, when he's like, you know, I don't really want to boast, but bear with this foolishness for a little bit. I don't want to sound like these super apostles who claim all these great things. They never really did anything, but they were good at what they did with their words. And the Corinthians were confused. And then he begins to talk about everything he went through. And in chapter 11 of 2 Corinthians, he says, but my deep concern." Besides all of these things, the beatings, the trials, the adversities, the highs, the lows. Man, I remember years ago in a pastor's conference, Pastor Chuck reading through that text. And then after, he says to the guys there, he says, you wimps. <laughs> because look at all that Paul went through and yet endured. And what was more concerning to him wasn't what's going to happen to him or man, look at how much I've done. Or look at everything I've went through. Where was God when I was shipwrecked? Where was God when I was left dead? Where was God when I was hungry, naked? All of these things. Listen, everything that he laid out, he didn't say any of that. He says, you know what concerned him the most? My deep concern was for the church. That has always ministered to my heart. Because the question for me is, is that we should have this concern. We should have concern for the loss. We should also have concern for the body of Christ. Jude then goes on to say here in verse 4, For certain men have crept in unnoticed who long ago were marked out for this condemnation, ungodly men who turn the grace of our God into lewdness and deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, <clears throat> a couple of things we can take from this idea here certain things have crept in not only into the church but things have crept into your life in my life things have crept into our thought processes if you will things have crept into how we do ministry how we serve the lord how do we contend well we know that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal but they are mighty in the lord for one purpose for the pulling down of strongholds Listen, there are strongholds all around us. And sometimes you and I, we think that these are just these, these secret sins that we battle with or these things that are just so hard to live for God in these days. But sometimes we don't realize it's the battle in the mind. Remember when Peter said, he said, gird the loins of your mind? Well, your loins are not in your mind, man. Loins is that which reproduces. That's the picture and the idea in Scripture. And when he says... Guard the loins of your mind. He's talking about what you put in will ultimately come out. How you think. Now, we often encourage and challenge those to have a biblical worldview. And yes, this is what it is. Since the faith is entrusted to God's people, 
all believers, not just Christian leaders, not just us. This is why I think this is so important. You know, in my mind, I says, man, Lord, if we get a good handful of men, imagine if all of us were to take what we hear today and just live it out from this forward, how much of an impact we would make. Uh, there is a, 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 a website, I believe it's called the Pew Research or Pew something research. Check it out. Pew like pews that you sit in the church. But they do statistics. And what's interesting is it actually gives you statistics by county and cities. It's mind-blowing. So I looked up close by where I live, and I was able to click Riverside, California. And it gave statistics as to how many people claim to be evangelical Christians, let alone in California. It was mind-blowing. And, and, and the, the statistics are crazy. One of the ones that blew me away the most was prayer. There was, I think, 50-some percent believe that prayer should be done daily. But when asked, do you pray daily, like only 20% felt that it was important to attend a prayer meeting. Now, we shouldn't seem surprised. What is the least attended service during the week in church? The prayer meeting. It's funny how we hear the statistics and then we say, oh, mm, wow. I don't know if that's, that's not good or oh, I need to get there. You know, either one. But here's the point. These are some of the things that we are called to do in contending. So think about this. If this faith has once and for all been delivered and entrusted, Jude intends to stand against those who claim to receive new revelation, who claim to receive, because here's what it was. It was being attacked. And Jude is saying we need to stand against this attack. You know, I was speaking to my son on the way in, and I says, you know, 10, 15 years ago, we would say things like, hey, you know what? They're trying to pass this law, or they're trying to do this, and we need to be aware of it, and we need to be ready for it, and, and we need to do this, and we need to do that, and all of that you know, the church would some way engage, some ways not engage, whatever the case might be. And, you know, then it happens and the church seems surprised. Well, we're not living in those days of 10, 15 years ago. We're living in those days where laws are being passed right before our very eyes and it doesn't take that long. It happens instantly. And the church is being taken off guard. And listen to this, man. You need to stand strong in your biblical convictions more than ever. Jude then goes on to say here in all of this, with regard to this, we see that in this we learn a couple of things. In verse 4, he sets out two things. Number one is that he opposes these false teachers that are validating and or encouraging and sanctioning immoral behavior. Now think about this. You know, idolatry is rampant. It's always been rampant among God's people. Listen to this. Even the children of Israel in the Old Testament, even though even when God brought them out of Egypt, listen, he was always telling them, put your idols away. This was like in the wilderness, you know. This was even when they were in the promised land. He's telling them, put your idols away. Idolatry was something they wrestled with. But see, idolatry is just one step away from immorality. And ultimately, what I've always said is I have this conviction. I have this kind of belief in my heart that, that it's all about the image of God. And, and it's what I see in the Bible. The Bible says you and I are created in his image. And as Christians, we are being shaped and patterned into the image of Christ Jesus. But the enemy hates the fact that out of all of God's creation, we are created in his image. So the battle really is for God's image to be seen on this earth through his creation. And Satan's greatest work is to corrupt the image of God that is in us. See, none of his other creation can say we are created in the image of God. So I look at this, this is just my personal thing, in a broader sense. If Satan can corrupt the image of God in you, and some Christians don't realize that God takes a person like you and me. Think about this, man. Where were we before we came to faith in Christ? Where were you? Where did the Lord find you? 
Not where you found God. He was never lost. You were lost. Where did he find you? What were you doing when he found you? What was the mindset? What was the life you were living? What were the things you were involved in? And none of that deterred him from saying, yes, come. He set you free. He put his spirit in you. That's why Paul says, listen, we have this treasure in earthen vessels. Treasure in earthen vessels. It's you and I. And the Lord puts his treasure, the gospel, in us. For what purpose? Just so we can hold on to it and just say, hey, look at me. I'm a Christian now. No, it's to take that to a world that is desperately in need of Christ. Once we become Christians, we realize how desperately we were in need of him. Can I get a witness? You don't think there are others that are desperately in need of the Lord? But, But how will they ever know? Think about that for a moment. So Paul also gives a similar warning. Remember in Galatians chapter 1, he talks about those that that would infiltrate. He says in verse 6, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. You know, You might probably be wondering, what is the elephant in the room? What point are you trying to make? What is the greatest threat? I'll tell you what, we can spend the rest of this day talking about everything that is coming against the simplicity of the gospel of Jesus Christ, even in the church. I would say, just focus on the gospel grow in it, mature in it. Here's a couple of points here that I, I say are good for us just to consider. Uh, he goes on to say this thing with this warning that there are those who are what? They are infiltrating the church. They are, are causing them to, to embrace immoral behavior and they are perverting the grace of God. But he also says in verse four that they are rejecting the deity of Christ. And you know, today, there are many believe that there is other ways to be right with God. They believe that good works, or they believe, uh, you know, association with certain people or things. But the only way that you and I could be right with God is through Christ. It's this calling and bringing them back to just the simplicity of the truth. And he says this to the church. He says, Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to exhort you to contend for the faith. So this is a call to sound doctrine. We got to have that. Remember what Paul says in Ephesians chapter 4. He goes on to say this in verse 14, he says that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about every wind of doctrine by the trickery of man in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plottings. Don't be distracted. Understand that it's important for us to be in fellowship in the word of God, be built and established in his word. It's kind of like Colossians chapter 3, verse 16. Let the words of Christ dwell richly in you. This is what's needed. It's kind of like the day and age that we're living in. I'm I'm a book person. Do we have book people in here? Yeah. I'm not an app person. I I I, you know I, I I'm thankful for these beautiful software that they have for Bible studies, but I, I like libraries. I, I just love books. Something about taking the time to get it and go through it, remember certain ones and go and search through your library. I understand it's just easy with the click of a button, this and that. And I understand on your phone, it's good just to have the Bible here, you know, and you're able just to flip right through the app and this, this, this and that. But, but you know what we're seeing less and less of today is men carrying their Bibles. Men just being students of the word, men that are really taking it in and being encouraged by it. And, and clearly people seeing men walking around with their Bibles. Listen, you know, it, it, it really challenges a heart when they see that. Because what we're declaring is we're saying, this is 
the manner, this is the mode, this is the standard by which we live. We live by the word of God. And so what we see here is that there's a call to sound doctrine. There's also a call to discerning truth from error. Remember, as Paul wrote to the Thessalonians, he said this to them very clearly in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, in, in verse 20, he goes on to say, Do not despise prophecies, test all things, hold fast what is good, abstain from every form of evil. So there's a call here to sound doctrine. There's a call here to discerning truth from error. And there is a call to be willing to contend, listen to this, and attack error. You know, we have to be aggressive. You remember that passage there in Matthew where it says the kingdom of God suffereth violence, but the violent take it by force. You know, people kind of read that verse and like, wow, this is, this is amazing. But what it's saying is that violently we press forward. There has to be that attitude in our heart that we press in. And sometimes you're going to get in some battles and skirmishes, but we press forward. We don't shrink back. We don't, we don't give up ground at all whatsoever. We stay the course. We remain committed to the cause and sold out to do what God's called us to do. So consider this for a moment. In verse 20 of this chapter here in Jude, he says, but you, beloved, building yourselves up. There is a need for us to grow in our faith. There is a need for you and I to be built up in our faith, and we are to keep pressing ourselves forward, moving forward, growing spiritually, and this is a big part of our spiritual development. So many men say, I want to be spiritually strong. You need it. For those of you that are married, you need it in your marriage. For those of you that are fathers, you need it in your parenting. You need it in being a father. And for those of us that say we love Jesus, we need to be more so spiritually strong to contend for the faith. And you know what? Sometimes we need to do it even in our own homes. It's not about fighting those around you. It's about a spiritual battle and a spiritual fight. You know what? I was looking at this earlier. I thought this was an amazing text to consider. In 1 John... In chapter 2, just listen to these words. And I, I want to leave this verse with you guys. Listen to these words here. It says, I write to you, little children, verse 12, 1 John 2, 12. I write to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. I write to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you have overcome the wicked one. I write to you, little children, because you have known the Father. I have written to you, fathers, because you have known him who was from the beginning. I have written to you, young men, because you are strong and the word of God abides in you and you have overcome the wicked one. Those are pretty powerful verses, right? I mean, this is a call and an address. This is a challenge. This is also a reminder. He even goes on to say in the rest of verse 20, he says, building yourselves up in your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. What does it mean to pray in the Holy Spirit? Well, I believe that we are to pray as the Spirit leads. I believe that we are to pray with understanding, and to pray in the Holy Spirit, well, one is that our lives as Christians is spiritual. And we need to know what it is to walk in the Spirit because that's how we battle. This is what Paul speaks about in Galatians 5. And sometimes, men, we don't know how to battle. <laughs> the only way we know how to battle is with words and anger and an emotion but the Bible says that the fruit of the Spirit, the evidence of God's Spirit at work in our life that equips us, that prepares us for the battle is love, Amen. joy, peace, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, kindness, long-suffering, and self-control. Yes, these are the works that are evident. And then with that very working of the Holy Spirit, he assists us while we pray. 
Some of us men just need a fresh work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. But you know what? The Spirit of God cannot dwell where wickedness dwells. They say, oh, I just want a fresh outpouring of the Spirit. Well, consider what has taken place in your heart. There's not room for two. Jesus said it very clearly. You can't serve two masters. You'll love one and hate the other. The other thing he goes on to say here is keeping yourselves in the love of God. That's another good point there. That we are to keep ourselves in God's love. And that would mean that we live a life of faith in obedience to God. Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. In other words, if you love me, you will obey me. Do we love the Lord today? It'll be evident by how we live our lives. John 15, 10, if you keep my commandments, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. The Lord has captivated our hearts, has he not? Romans 6, 17 says, But thanks be to God that you were once slaves of sin and have become obedient from the heart to, to the standard of teaching to which you were committed. That's an amazing truth. The ultimate expression of our obedience to God is shown also in our loving others. Sometimes we think that being bold or contending means that we have to be unloving. No, that's quite the opposite. You're working against what the scriptures teach. There's a way to be firm and bold even in your love. But remember that image thing? It never misrepresents what God's love is if you are created in his image. It doesn't mean you accept things and you accept sin and none of that. It has nothing to do with that. It has everything to do with I look at it this way. Sometimes I find it hard to deal with people. Can I get a witness? Okay, so. But you know what I say? You know what? This is what I always do. When I find myself getting that way, I understand one thing right from the get-go. It's my flesh, nothing else. Because God never says that about us. And what I always say is, Lord, because I'm wrestling with this and because I'm dealing with this, I'm choosing to not love them the way you do or see them the way you do. Help me, Lord, to be more like you in that area. I often think of how many more people I could have brought to faith in Christ if I didn't let my flesh get in the way. How many more people? It's like, you know, when you, you start thinking about all the dumb stuff you spent money on, like eating out. For some. And then you start thinking about it. You're like, man, if I would have put all that money away in savings, man, how much money would I have today in 10 years? Yeah, some of you thought about that. That's why you're like, goodness. All the dumb stuff, right? Okay, now think about it. Think about it. Now you think about it. You're like, man, what was I thinking? And you still go on and do it anyways after that. It's just a good thought. <laughs> but imagine, imagine how many people we could have brought to the Lord Jesus Christ. Another thing he goes on to say here, keeping yourselves, then he says, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Waiting in hope. We must keep the fire of hope alive in our hearts. Jesus is coming back. Okay. That's always a response, just a real, amen. I mean, that's what we've been saying for a long time now. Jesus is coming back. Amen. I mean, come on, guys. You should be telling the whole world that Christ is coming back. Well, we don't know the day or the hour, but we know it's close. And I'm sure that our dear brother Don Stewart will highlight that. Thank God for ministries like this. Listen, we need to wait in hope expectantly. I want to end on this note that I think would be good for all of us. It's this idea of communion. I just was thinking about this. 
sometimes we can really get into just the simplicity of practice and traditions and ceremonialism. And you know what? Our prayer lives become that. Attending men's conferences become that. Reading the Bible becomes that. It should be our form of living. How did the early church view communion? Well, we don't really know because the disciples were just kind of tripping out. You know, they thought Jesus would never leave them. In Matthew chapter 26, in verse 26, Jesus, I believe, institutes, you know, a sacrament. He gives it to the church right there, communion. But there's something that Jesus says that has just blown me away. We know that communion clearly is Jesus preparing to go to the cross. It's a beautiful picture. And he talks about his body being broken, right? And he says, this is my body, which is broken for you. And then he says, this is the cup. My blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Beautiful picture. But then Jesus also goes on to say in Matthew 26, he says, but I will not drink. But I will not drink, he says. Of this fruit of the vine until I drink it anew with you in my father's kingdom. I will not drink of the fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it anew with you in my father's kingdom. Communion is not just the present work of the cross as Jesus was looking ahead. Communion also looks to the second coming of Jesus Christ. And this is what Paul even says in uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, in verse 23. He He reiterates this thing, and then he says this. He says, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death. That's what Jesus was speaking about right here. Then he says, Till he comes. So there is an idea that, listen to this, our lives should always be lived in anticipation of the second coming of Jesus Christ. And we should always be ready. And as I stated earlier, if there would be a concern about the church, it would be that she's not ready for her groom. We need to be. Don't get sidetracked, men. Don't get sidetracked. The gospel still saves. And the only hope for this world in administration or whatever people are tripping out on today, it's Jesus. It always has been. It always will be until he comes again. May we be those men that put the flesh to death. And we say, Lord, fill us with your spirit that we might do the work that could only be done through the power and work and ministry of the Holy Spirit in our lives. That's you today. I want to pray with you. Stand to your feet if that's you. I want to pray with you.